Good evening, everyone. My name is John Mack. I'm Director of Public Programs with the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. Delighted to see you all tonight for what will be a great conversation. Before we get started, tonight's conversation is on the record and we are live streaming. So please turn off your, uh, your cell phone ringers, but keep them on so you can tweet and Instagram and Facebook quotes throughout the night. As you know, public discussion is central to our work and I'd like to highlight some upcoming events that may be of interest. We're excited to host the second annual Chicago Forum on Global Cities, which will take place on Wednesday, June 1st through Friday, June 3rd. Global leaders and in business, education, civics, and the arts will converge on Chicago to discuss global cities, and you can sign up for individual events online, and it, nearly all of it will be live streamed as well. On Friday, June 24th, in partnership with the World Economic Forum, uh, an expert group of panelists will discuss American leadership in the 2016 election and America's overall role in the world. And on Monday, June 27th, join Thomas R. Pickering and James F. Jeffrey for an assessment of the Iran deal and how it will affect Obama's enduring foreign policy legacy. Turning back to tonight, Dr. Zalmay Khalil Zad's book, The Envoy from Kabul to the White House, My Journey Through a Turbulent World, will be available for purchase and signing from the bookseller Outback. And to formally introduce our speakers, please join me in welcoming the project coordinator at the Pearson Institute for the Study of Resolution of Com Global Conflict at the University of Chicago and valued YP member of the council, Paul Hoffman. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us today. On behalf of the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, I'm delighted to welcome the Honorable Dr. Zalmay Khalilzad. Very, we are very fortunate to have Dr. Khalilzad with us today to discuss his experience in diplomacy and foreign policy, having served as a U.S. Ambassador in Afghanistan and Iraq, and as a diplomat under three presidents, our speaker has a distinct knowledge of American foreign policy in the Middle East. Dr. Khalil Zad was the highest ranking Muslim American in the White House at the time of the September 11th attacks, and he offered unique perspective to subsequent U.S. operations in Afghanistan and Iraq. The lessons he has garnered on the delicate politics of U.S. intervention remain hugely valuable today. As we debate the legacy of intervention and discuss the future of U.S. policy, Dr. Khalil Zad's perspective has an important layer to that story. His career bears witness to some of the most crucial moments in U.S. foreign policy, including its role in the Soviet-Afghan War and the occupations of Afghanistan and Iraq. I look forward to hearing Dr. Khalil Zad speak about his personal journey and policy insights. You should have a copy of our speaker's bio, but allow me to highlight a few of his achievements. Dr. Zalmay Khalil Zad is a former U.S. ambassador to Afghanistan, Iraq, and the United Nations. He has served in the administrations of Ronald Reagan, George H.W. Bush, and George W. Bush, he is a counselor, he's a U.S. counselor at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, the president of Griffin Partners, and I'm proud to say an alumnus of the University of Chicago. He will be joined in conversation by Ms. Cecile Shea, State Department Fellow at the Chicago Council of Global Affairs. Ms. Shea has over two decades of experience as an American diplomat and serves as the council's link to diplomats and foreign policy officials around the world. Ms. Shea will lead our conversation and moderate the question and answer period. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the Honorable Dr. Zalmay Halilzad and Ms. Cecile, Cecile Shea. Well, it's an honor to be here tonight talking to you. Thank you for coming to Chicago to meet with all of us. Um, first of all, I loved the book, and I especially loved the way that you combined the human element, your own life story, with your analysis of recent history, much of which you influenced, and um, with some policy suggestions for how the US can move forward in this difficult time. So I thought we could start with some of the human element, your own personal story. You grew up in Afghanistan. Um, tell me what it was like to grow up in Afghanistan in the 50s and 60s. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, uh, I, as I uh, was told, I graduated from the University of Chicago, so uh, the, the university had a huge impact uh, on my life, on my career, and uh, delighted to be back in the in, uh, windy city, which uh, I had uh, also not only I learned a lot, uh, a lot, I had a good life here too. It, it was nice to be in Chicago. Uh, with regard to Afghanistan and my early life, uh, Afghanistan in the 50s and 60s uh, was a, a peaceful place. Uh, uh, a, a, an evolving place in terms of uh, democratization. It was ruled by a king uh, who was 
a very gentlemanly figure uh, who wasn't that interested really in ruling. Uh, he uh, embraced a constitution that delegated a lot of authority to the prime minister. And when the coup happened in 1973, rather than challenge it, challenging it, he immediately uh, sent his resignation uh, letter. Uh, and uh, he was very humane. He, for example, refused to, to, uh, to sign the death penalty when the courts uh, uh, issued it. Uh, they made a judgment that somebody should be hanged. He, he used to leave the country for holiday to have his prime minister sign the death penalty. Uh, and it, it was an open place. Ben Ki-moon, uh, uh, whom I got to know, the Secretary General of the UN, uh, told me the story and that he uh, was a counselor in the South Korean embassy in uh, Delhi, but he covered Afghanistan from there. And that uh, whenever he went to uh, Kabul for his each six months he used to visit it, he used to collect orders from uh, Indians, friends, and some other embassies for goods that they couldn't get in India because India used to be a closed market in those days, and Afghanistan is an open market, and one of the most popular items were blue jeans that he used to go buy them in Kabul to take back uh, to India. As far as my personal uh, family life in those days were concerned, uh, I was born in northern Afghanistan near the old Soviet border in, in Uzbekistan now. And it had been a great center of civilization at one point, Balkh, which was uh, uh, regarded the mother of cities, uh, that universities, that, that uh, uh, educational centers. Rumi, the famous uh, Sufi poet, was born uh, nearby. It had many other great thinkers of Middle Ages uh, uh, of that Central Asia in that region, but it had declined. It was a small town of 50,000, very under, underdeveloped. Uh, we didn't have electricity, we didn't have running water, uh, the, there was uh, no television, and there was uh, only one radio station from Kabul that you could listen to, the national radio station. Uh, uh, medical services were very limited. Uh, my mother, who had married at the age of uh, 13 or so, uh, produced her first child when she was 15. 13 children. Uh, uh, she had seven of whom had uh, died at an early age. And uh, uh, when I was born, the two other boys that had been born before me had died. So uh, the family was very worried that I might also have a similar fate. Uh, and uh, if you, uh, my left ear as a whole, because uh, they put a ring in my left ear to dedicate me to the shrine that uh, is in Mazar, uh, the, uh, the first Im Shia Imam, or the fourth Caliph, uh, depending on uh, which uh, Shia or Sunni uh, versions. Uh, Ali, uh, uh, Afghans and people in Mazar believe that Ali the f is buried there, but in fact, when I was in Iraq, uh, the, the Iraqis believe he's buried in Najaf, which is probably, it hurt me to admit as a former a citizen of Afghanistan, but uh, that it's more plausible that he's buried in Najaf rather than that he went all the way from uh, uh, to Afghanistan. Uh, the, the legend is his body was put on a camel, and wherever the camel sat, that's where he was buried. And the camel going from Iraq all the way to Afghanistan would be a long way. But in any case, uh, uh, it, 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 it was uh, a very... Uh, different world, uh, and uh, I came to Kabul. I was there for about 18 months before coming to New York on an exchange student program, the American Field Service, and, and, and when I landed in, in, in Tehran uh, for one night, it looked like a different world, uh, much more developed uh, than in Afghanistan, and then to come to New York, it was a shock of my life. It was, uh, you know, in so many ways that I describe in the book, uh, even the weather, I had a hard time adjusting to uh, August, uh, very humid, very hot. I had never experienced air conditioning before, and uh, each hotel room had uh, its own unit of air conditioning. Uh, nobody had told me how to turn it on, so I, I could 
not sleep for several nights because it was so hot and humid, but the, 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 the physical uh, looks of New York, the population, the size, the intensity the, uh, was, uh, was shocking. And then I moved, up, moved on to California, to San Joaquin Valley, and I spent a year, which also changed my world, so to speak. So uh, uh, during almost uh, two years, first to Kabul, to adjust to Kabul, this country bumpkin, so to speak, that I was from coming from a small town, and then to come to the US was, uh, was uh, uh, transformative and a, a huge, huge difference. Uh, 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 in the way that ex the Afghanistan was organized, Mazar was organized, and Kabul, and uh, of course the U.S. So if I were king for a day, the first thing I would do is take the State Department's exchange budget yeah. and increase it a hundredfold, because I just think that these exchanges change people's lives and, and change entire countries. So. How did that experience of being an AFS student change you? Ooh, uh, well, it changed me completely in many ways, uh, in the sense that uh, I began to question so many things, uh, because uh, the, the first, the difference in the level of development shocked me. Uh, the, and uh, I had a, a certain degree of self-confidence, I don't know why, from er, uh, early on, and to see that, why was it that, uh, you know, uh, uh, that Mazar Sharif, for example, or Afghanistan was so uh, undeveloped, let's say. Uh, and what had happened that, because in the books and stories that you're told, you're told about the glories of Afghanistan and the past of Central Asia, of uh, places like Bal, Herat, Samarkand, Bukhara. I see some people from that region uh, originally in the audience. So, and when you in fact see it, that uh, you, uh, you know there has been a huge decline, uh, and which is a lesson that you can't take your greatness for granted. Uh, it, uh, you can be on top, but you, if, if 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 you don't adapt and change and innovate, you uh, you can decline. And so that was uh, that question in my own mind, and then seeing uh, the differences how the U.S. was organized, the family life. Uh, we tended to be very authoritarian in our household, you know, a lot of respect for the father. Uh, we wouldn't speak back to the father. We wouldn't argue with the father. We wouldn't, uh, uh, we would be intimidated, make sure, uh, we, you know, we don't anger him and in any way question his authority. And sitting at the dining table uh, with the American household was a different experience. Uh, and it's sort of uh, men-woman relations, uh, mother to father, because the father uh, is, is very dominant, uh, at least in my family, he was. And uh, uh, here, uh, the, uh, the, the father uh, uh, of the household in Modesto, or Ceres, which was near Modesto, worked for Gallo Wine, as an engineer, the mother taught uh, in school, uh, and uh, my mother never went to school. And although she was very strongly pro-education, and she used to check my homework, I didn't know why she checked it, because, uh, but nevertheless, she did. Uh, and I suspected she may actually know how to read. Uh, but in any case, it was, uh, it was uh, the, the, how the society organized, the ro uh, role of civil society, these various organizations, the Rotary Club, PTA, the church groups, all of this, uh, how day-to-day -day life was, was so, so, so different that there was an alternative way, at least there may be many alternatives, but I saw an alternative way that uh, a society can be organized and run uh, very different than uh, than uh, than Afghanistan. So you went back. Mm -hmm. oh, okay, okay. You went back to Afghanistan, and then another great thing happened. You, the U.S. government gave you a scholarship to study at the American University in Beirut, right. and then from there you came to Chicago and studied here. Right. What did you learn about foreign policy and about the Middle East? through those experiences? Well, Beirut exposed me to, uh, uh, first of all, those of you uh, I mean, uh, that don't know Beirut in the 70s, that's when I was there, the early 70s, was just a wonderful place. Uh, it was uh, uh, very open and uh, peaceful, although it, like, one could see that it was coming under pressure because of the 
uh, Israeli-Arab uh, tensions. Uh, it was too weak to protect itself, and so uh, others uh, came into uh, Lebanon uh, to fight uh, their fights on someone else's territory. And uh, uh, this was the age of Arab nationalism. Uh, Islamic movements were beginning to, uh, to, to emerge. Uh, uh, there were tensions between uh, Christians and uh, Muslims, and Muslims themselves, there were tensions between Shiites who were growing in numbers and, and the Sunni establishment. And uh, uh, his political structure was organized. The pre president, the Christian, prime minister, Sunni, Arab, uh, speaker of parliament, Shiite, Arab. And uh, I also became more aware of, uh, of uh, the crisis of Islamic civilization in the sense that, uh, like I had questioned in my own head, coming to America about what was wrong with Afghanistan, that Afghanistan was uh, doing so poorly, and that for a decade, if not for centuries, there was this crisis uh, that Islam or the Muslim world at one time was doing so well, was a civilization on uh, marching forward, and, and now it was doing poorly, uh, that others had become much more powerful. In fact, uh, they had, uh, become so powerful that the borders of the countries like Lebanon, uh, Syria, Iraq was determined by outside powers. Uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and the response to this question, what went wrong and what should we do, had uh, created four or five different schools of thought that were in conflict with each other and without agreement on the rules of the game for settling the disputes. I became much more aware of the Israeli-Palestinian issues. Uh, 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 and uh, and uh, uh, also the economic circumstances, especially of the Shia uh, population in Lebanon uh, that was uh, doing badly, although the numbers were increasing. So it was a, a huge learning experience. Chicago, uh, where I came, uh, sometimes, uh, you know, a lot of training and discipline, uh, uh, work makes a huge difference in your life. Sometimes an accidental meeting or an event can have a profound effect on, on one's life. And in my case, the meeting Professor Albert Wolster of the University of Chicago had a huge impact on, on my career. I was interested in problems of epistemology and comparative politics development and, and, and uh, uh, accidentally, one time I was invited by a friend who was taking a course with Albert Walser to attend his lecture, and I, 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 I went, and he was a nuclear strategist, one of our great nuclear strategists of the uh, Cold War period, uh, perhaps the author of the first strike, second strike distinction, those of, uh, who are old enough to remember the Cold War, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, um, he and I developed a bond uh, together, and I, I then uh, became a student of his as a research assistant, as a teaching assistant, a consultant to his company, uh, all in the course of the se a couple of years that I was. Uh, I studied with him, and, and I became much more of, uh, interested in nuclear strategy, on strategy and foreign policy issues. Uh, so. Uh, whatever happened afterwards to me, uh, which is uh, you know teaching at Columbia or working at the research institution or government service, uh, was due to uh, in part, or uh, I would say in a, uh, to a significant degree, uh, due to University of Chicago and to Albert Wolster. Mm. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, you now have this broad background, and you turn out to be um, kind of the perfect person for a new world situation that starts to occur in 1978, 79. So I thought we could go through, um, in the time that we have left, about 15 minutes, four topics. Yeah. Afghanistan, right. um, Iraq, um, Islamic State and Islamic extremism, and then Iran. Yeah. So let's start with Afghanistan. Well, first, uh, you know, uh, I see, uh, like your leader here yeah. uh, knows uh, uh, this very well. I, when I was a younger, uh, an assistant professor at Columbia University, I was awarded a fellowship by the Council on Foreign Relations, uh, which those of you who don't know, 
they choose young academics uh, who teach foreign policy and give their salaries and place them in government as a, a freebie, if you like, and uh, that they learn how r real world works and the government benefits from the uh, sm assuming a smart person helping them uh, kind of uh, uh, in their work. And I w got mine uh, based on a proposal dealing with nuclear issues, uh, the relationship between vertical proliferation, the superpowers building their nuclear capabilities and, uh, and horizontal, the spread of nuclear weapons to other countries and whether war in one would affect the war with the other, so to speak. And I was an advisor to uh, Dr. E. Clay, who was the Under Secretary of Defense in the Reagan administration. Uh, and one day he came and said, I traded you to the, and what, do, uh, what do you mean? I, he said, Mike Ormacos, who was the undersecretary, is opposite number in the State Department. Somehow your name came up, and I said that you were working for me uh, on the nuclear issues. And he said, what? Uh, isn't he born in Afghanistan? <laughs> Wasn't he born in Afghanistan? And he said, well, I don't know. Maybe he is. Uh, and he said, well, we need him uh, in the State Department to help with Afghanistan. So I told Fred, uh, listen, I was born there, but I, it doesn't mean I really know much about Afghanistan just because I was born there. So he said, listen, uh, I have, the deal is done. <laughs> you are going there. So I, I, I went uh, to uh, the State Department, and I was uh, ultimately made a member of the policy planning staff for, for Secretary Schultz. And I was given two tasks uh, to worry about. One was the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. It was a simple task. We want to make it as hard as possible for them. <laughs> Two, Iraq and Iran war. And we want to make sure neither side wins or loses. Uh, so uh, see, uh, other than that, uh, you know, go and see what you can do to give us some th <laughs> thoughts on this issue. So, uh, and I was there. And I actually, uh, uh, one thing that I learned is that I liked uh, and the kind of work that government does. I like the politics of policy making also, how you get your views uh, to be accepted. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, you know, both cooperation and competition involved in the interagency process. And I became, uh, uh, both I liked it and my ideas found uh, uh, okay. people seem to like it and so I, I prospered, so to speak, and I became, uh, an, uh, I would say, a relatively important player in, uh, in deliberating on those issues as a source of ideas and proposing alternatives uh, to, uh, and, and proposing adjustments. Uh, uh, we did, uh, we succeeded beyond expectations in both. Uh, we, wa we thought the Soviet would win at the end, uh, <laughs> They, uh, which was a reasonable assumption, but turned out to be wrong. Uh, they, uh, they left. They abandoned Afghanistan in the Iran-Iraq war. Uh, the Iraqis at the end did better. At the end, uh, they came, to, uh, uh, at the end of the war, they were in a stronger position than Iran, rather than a kind of a stalemate, which uh, we would have expected. And, uh, we didn't adjust, in my view, in time appropriately to these changes, particularly in Afghanistan. And uh, the our earlier assumption about uh, Afghanistan, uh, the Soviets winning at the distorting effect, uh, in, in, uh, in which we didn't think about what would happen in post-Soviet Afghanistan, we, because we didn't think there would be a post-Soviet Afghanistan. And uh, when it looked like they were going to leave, we had a hard time adjusting policy uh, to work for a government in Afghanistan that could maintain some degree of stability and order. And chaos took place afterwards, and we disengaged. Uh, and our disengagement and chaos led to a civil war that was quite intense. Kabul was destroyed in that civil war. And extremism uh, in the form of Taliban uh, took over at the end. And uh, uh, then we know that an Al-Qaeda Taliban alliance occurred that produced 9-11 ultimately. Uh, so uh, that's one lesson that, uh, 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 that uh, some disengagement, sometimes engagement is as costly, but disengagement also can be extremely uh, costly. 
uh, and uh, if you don't want to pay now, you may have to pay a lot more later, so to speak, because of the, the disengagement. And in the case of Iran-Iraq war, ultimately we know two wars were fought, uh, one in Kuwait and then uh, the, the U.S. invasion of Iraq uh, because of the, some of the lack of adjustments or adaptation, appropriate adaptation uh, at the end of that war. So fast forwarding to today, we're again having a debate on how quickly we should disengage in Afghanistan, particularly militarily. Um, what, what do you think? What, what is your recommendation? Well, in the case of uh, uh, Afghanistan, I, uh, my recommendation is that we are potentially on a uh, successful trajectory, potentially, I say, uh, uh, if, unless we prematurely cut and run, so, uh, which is that if we, we used to have over 100,000 troops in Afghanistan, now we are at 10,000 with the uh, Afghans uh, taking over the responsibility uh, for uh, the war and we in a more supporting role. Uh, and uh, this uh, shift in the balance with you take lots of American power out mm -hmm. has uh, encouraged the Taliban to think that this may be a, a moment of opportunity for them to test the Afghan forces, perhaps to uh, inflict a defeat uh, totally on them and get the forces to, to disintegrate. Uh, despite the fact that they've uh, lost some territory, and they have, and they have at times perform poorly as they have, but uh, they have held together, there has been no disintegration. And I believe that, uh, that we should, uh, if we can stay uh, with the uh, forces at, uh, sufficient, uh, at levels that are sufficient, and I think by all accounts that I read and trust about 10 to 12,000 for the next year or two would be sufficient, uh, that, that, that they could handle this I would also add that we need to redouble our effort with Pakistan and Afghanistan to deal with the issue of sanctuaries in Pakistan, because when you have an insurgency that has a safe sanctuary, mm -hmm. it becomes much tougher to deal with, and we need uh, to be engaged diplomatically to bring about an improvement in the situation in which the sanctuary is reduced uh, and I think that, that then make it safer even to withdraw more forces. Uh, but at this point, I'm against withdrawing further. I know that President Obama has decided to reduce it to 5,000 by the end of his term. I, I, I would rather prefer that he leaves the decision to the next president who looks at the situation anew and decides whether uh, a further reduction is prudent or not. But uh, I think uh, the decision, however, has been made uh, to reduce it to 5,000 before the end of this year. So your, old, your former um, ASF friend and yes. classmate from um, American University of Beirut is right. now the president of sure. Afghanistan, Asfar yes. Ghani. Uh, he has talked about negotiating with some of the various groups which the US happens to consider terrorist organizations. What is the role on the political side, um, particularly negotiations with some of these groups in securing Afghanistan's ability to move forward? Obviously very important. Uh, unfortunately, uh, when you need them badly, it's harder to get those negotiations. So when you don't need them badly, it becomes better prospect. Uh, I see that uh, one of the opposing groups, uh, uh, some led by someone that I had to deal with during the 80s a lot, uh, Gulbuddin Hekmatyar, uh, who was uh, leading the largest uh, resistance group against the Soviets, who refused to come and see President Reagan, uh, um, uh, and later on was put on a list by us, is about to complete an agreement with the government to reconcile. Uh, uh, and I noticed that today or yesterday, our government issued a statement saying uh, we, ha we were okay with that, mm -hmm. that, that we would co cooperate with the implementation of a reconciliation agreement which would, I assume, mean that we will get them off of our list and also get them off of the list of the, on the UN uh, list of, uh, of uh, suspects. So uh, I think uh, uh, reconciliation is very important. Uh, um, uh, um, for it to happen, 
uh, I believe one of the factors is Pakistan, because that's where the sanctuaries are. The infrastructure is there. So if uh, there is an Afghan-Pakistan agreement, although there is now a four-party negotiations with China, US, Pakistan, and Afghanistan focused on this reconciliation problem, it hasn't produced enough positive results. Uh, but also, if the government can hold its own, uh, and uh, that's why the U.S. presence issue is so important, the perception that the U.S. is going to leave or reduce forces convinces the opponents to believe that time is on their side, the U.S. is going to cut and run, and then we will be in a stronger position against the government. So. That's why I think it's very important to signal uh, that uh, we'll, uh, we'll be there uh, for as long as it takes. Uh, I want to say one other thing here, uh, which is that I know currently in our political process, state building and nation building is very unpopular. And uh, of course, we did something extraordinary, two big state and nation building simultaneously, Iraq and Afghanistan, with gazillions of dollars spent. But I do believe that sometimes to solve a strategic problem with regard to a piece of territory, uh, we would have to selectively, but we would have to do state and nation building because if a territory, the president of the United States representing the nation says, this territory, I do not want it to fall into the hands of terrorists or extremists, then who controls that territory? It would be us or it would be locals that we can work with. Locals we can work with is better, in my view, than us controlling it. And therefore, you have to do uh, uh, not the two simultaneous huge ones. We probably all will not do that for the for in the foreseeable future. But to, I worry that some of the skills that we have acquired, some of the experiences we acquired in this atmosphere, we say no more nation building, no more state building, are going to evaporate. Uh, we've learned it with a uh, huge cost. And I worry that. Uh, five years, six years down the road, we will start all over again uh, as if uh, they, uh, we didn't uh, do these things. So I, I think there is still a role, and we should preserve the capability, some of it, and, uh, and the asset, uh, because uh, uh, I, I do believe that we will do these things again at the smaller level. What if ISIS takes over? You're going to talk about ISIS, Damascus. What are we going to do? about that? Or are we going to say, well, if we don't do state and nation building, uh, we're just going to keep bombing Damascus? Uh, 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 so that I think there is going to be a role, a continuing role for our state and nation building, but then a smart, based on lessons learned uh, uh, selectively and, 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 and uh, uh, not to repeat some of the mistakes we made in Iraq and Afghanistan, but uh, learn the right lessons, not to overlearn the lessons of Iraq. So overall, do you consider our state and nation building efforts in Afghanistan to have been a success? I think a moderate, uh, it, it's, short, it's fallen short of uh, expectation, no doubt about this. But it, I believe it has, uh, Afghanistan is fundamentally different than it was uh, uh, 15 years ago. It had no institutions. I remember I was shocked. Uh, the president asked me to go be the, our first ambassador to Afghanistan. And I said, Mr. President, I remember, I left there. What did I do wrong? That you want to send me back? And and uh, so then he said, "Well, uh, uh, you go as an envoy, then be in and uh, the White House." And uh, when I went there, uh, uh, having not gone there for over thirty years, I was shocked by the level of devastation, destruction, by absence of infrastructure, absence of any institutions, because uh, the Taliban were kind of militia, and uh, we had defeated them, but the other militias we had worked with because we wanted to keep uh, a, a light footprint, uh, and, uh, and uh, state institutions were in disarray. 900,000 kids went to school that, uh, you know, really, we couldn't really call them schools. Uh, the bank at the central bank at the, this is a population of 30 million at 25 million dollars uh, 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 was just I just was shocked by what uh, the devastation that the Afghans suffered and uh, by by what we had taken on given the uh, the, uh, the uh, so circumstances that I found there. Now, you know, they have a couple of hundred thousand armed forces, uh, they have a police force, they have uh, uh, 
central bank that functions. You know, there is corruption, there is uh, lots of issues, but it's a, fundamentally a different place. People live much longer than they did before, uh, women's rights issues. And I think that if we, st if we maintain a, a certain level of presence uh, and uh, assist uh, and do what the other things that I mentioned, there's a chance that they could, uh, they could make it. So therefore, uh, uh, I think uh, uh, I would have done certain things differently, of course, but, uh, but I think uh, the, the Afghanistan has a chance. So how do you grade our efforts in Iraq then? I think Iraq, we made it hard for ourselves. I, I grade our, uh, the way we went in very badly, uh, whatever you think of the timing, and I was not personally in favor of the timing, uh, because I was in Afghanistan. <laughs> I wanted all the attention there, but uh, uh, that, that's, you, you stand where you sit, so to speak, so, but I wasn't, I, I didn't have a role in that uh, selection. And then we made it hard by um, uh, kind of, Abandoning the plans that we had, uh, we uh, we uh, uh, were going to liberate Iraq uh, because of weapons of mass destruction uh, allegedly, uh, but the weapons of mass destruction were not found. I don't believe President Bush made up the intelligence, uh, false intelligence. Uh, he knew there were no weapons of mass destruction and said, "Let's cook the, uh, some intelligence that there were weapons of mass destruction," but. Uh, uh, we wanted to liberate, the uh, plan was, we wanted to get the Iraqi armed forces reformed so they would maintain security with the Iraqis running their government with some uh, mo uh, modest level of, uh, of uh, U.S. support and presence. Uh, the overthrow occurs, uh, uh, we uh, go from liberation to occupation, we dissolve the army, uh, we uh, do deep debatification and then uh, do give the implementation of the debatification to a political committee rather than a judiciary. Uh, uh, and uh, 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 we want to maintain a small force. The combination dissolve the forces that exist and anger them. These are people who knew how to use force. They co uh, couldn't get paid for a while and they were uh, uh, dissolved, then uh, uh, have a small U.S. force itself was self-inflicted wounds of the initial period. And one of the things I tried to do in the course of this book is to, you know, what happened that, uh, to change uh, policy so radically and what lessons one can learn from that. And uh, I, I have tried to, I've tried to explain that. But I think I give President Bush a credit uh, while I give, him, give the whole group a poor mark for how we went in, that he adjusted, uh, and I also give President Obama uh, relatively poor marks for uh, kind of disengaging uh, 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 too much uh, the way we left, uh, and uh, we see the consequences of that as well. So one of those consequences is the Islamic State. Right. Um, is there a way for us to prevail? I mean. Are we still going to be talking about the Islamic State and the risk from the Islamic State 15 years from now? I will, probably we won't be talking about this, uh, the risk from Islamic State 15 years from now, but we would be talking, in my view, the risk from is Islamic extremism and terrorism probably 15 years from now and longer. There are two things, I mean, I have a crude way of, of expressing uh, uh, the way I think about this. Uh, one is, uh, uh, and I hope I don't offend anyone, I don't mean, I'm just using this as an uh, analogy, which is the problem of mosquitoes uh, and the swamp. Uh, the uh, mosquito is the, uh, the individual terrorist that we see now, the equivalent, which is that, you know, uh, ISIS. When I was in Iraq, we had to deal with the problem of Al-Qaeda in Iraq, which was uh, Zarqawi was the head of, and I remember calling the president saying, we've got, we, 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 we've, we found where he is and we, uh, we eliminated him. And we, through what we did, uh, reach, uh, reaching out to the Sunnis, national unity government, working with the tribes, uh, uh, getting the government in Baghdad to cooperate, although reluctantly, and to professionalize their army, uh, we made a lot of progress. Uh, Al-Qaeda in Iraq was essentially de decimated by the time of, of what, 2008 or 9. But then when we uh, disengaged, left, uh, uh, you have a situation which 
uh, sectarianism gains. Maliki, the prime minister, uh, is worried about military coups within our absence because he saw our presence as a guarantor against a coup. A coup. And so he replaces all the professional officers with political loyalists uh, who <laughs> undermine the professional, uh, professionalism of the armed forces and uh, 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 mistreats the Sunnis again and uh, uh, creates circumstances in which extremism grows. So we can uh, go after the individual terrorists or even terrorist leaders as we did with Barqawi and maybe we'll get Baghdadi and maybe we'll liberate Mosul, we'll get Raqqa. But if the swamp is not addressed, uh, which would require mutual acceptance by Shia and Sunnis of each other, uh, which requires uh, governments that share power and treat their citizens fairly, uh, not based on sectarian preferences, which remains a uh, uh, fair dispensation, which requires also an agreement among the regional powers who are conducting through extremist groups uh, proxy wars for regional domination by one side or another, and I think of President Obama said it was Saudi Arabia and Iran that were conducting proxy warfare. I would add to it Turkey as the three major players who are uh, shaping the battle uh, of this region. And I have been, my lesson uh, there is that uh, we need a kind of uh, Westphalia, neo Westphalia type agreement among the Muslims, uh, which would uh, be some rules, uh, mutual acceptance of Shia and Sunni as being equally legitimate uh, Islams or Muslims, and some rules between uh, these three powers about how to conduct uh, themselves. Because th these, the crises in Iraq and Syria become intermingled. Uh, I have had, I continue to have dialogue with the leaders of the region. Uh, and uh, for example, if uh, the Sunni leaders of these Turkey and Saudi Arabia would tell me, how can we accept the Shia majority rule in Iraq if the Iranians will not accept a, a, a majority rule for Sunnis in Syria to have the similar role that, that they want for the Shia. It can't be that you, uh, we would accept uh, Shia rule in uh, Iraq because of majority rule, and in Syria we have to accept Alawite minority rule because the Iranians want that. Uh, and so they need a, 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 a regional deal. Uh, and we can play a role, and that requires, in my view, that not only we maintain relations with our friends, we need to engage Iran, we need to uh, also uh, uh, enhance both opposing Iranian efforts that are dis destabilizing, uh, but at the same time, as we enhance, as I advocate, we enhance that, we also enhance engagement with them. I've never understood and I've not supported why we wouldn't want to talk with, with, with them. Uh, I, mean, I have talked with them when I was a, a U.S. ambassador to Afghanistan and Iraq, and on some issues we have managed to get cooperation from them. Uh, so I, 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 I think uh, uh, that uh, enhanced engagement uh, uh, can help in terms of us playing the role that, uh, of facilitating along with others of this regional deal that I described. Without that, the dysfunctionality of this region, the crisis that I talked about earlier will produce extremists for as long as this crisis goes on and for as long as these uh, dysfunctionalities uh, continue. And which, another issue is high unemployment among young men in right. many of these countries. Well, the, the economic dysfunctionality. It, it, the, yeah. Do you need the, the Treaty of Westphalia before you can start working on some of the underlying economic problems? Or should we also be working on the underlying economic problems while the religious tensions um, work themselves out somehow? Well, I mean, uh, uh, I think you need the extremism challenge to be dealt with through these agreements. Uh, uh, and uh, making the region functional. I, you know, you have other places uh, where they have economic problems and you don't get the kind of uh, terrorism and so forth. So I, 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 I well, I think, uh, yes, we, uh, there needs to be for economic development, for, uh, for jobs, for uh, opportunities for young people, but I think uh, I don't accept that those are the reasons for extremism and terror. Extremism and terror is there because of this broader crisis and because of the use of extremism as an instrument of policy by intelligence organizations, security 
organization, some of, some of the states of the area as a proxy war in their competition with each other. And this is done not only by our friends are doing it, I have to say honestly, and, our, uh, and Iran is doing it too. They're just supporting different, uh, different extremist groups. Uh, but uh, uh, the roots of this uh, it goes uh, to uh, what I mentioned before, uh, and the geopolitical rivalry uh, between the, these powers. And, uh, and uh, uh, if you even look further to the east, you see that also in the South Asia context as well. Well, uh, thank you very much. I think that was a really interesting um, survey of both your own life, but also of how you view the uh, world as that we are living in these days. We're going to now take some questions from those of you who have them. If you could please wait for a mic to um, be brought to you, I'm going to put on my glasses. And if we could just ask that you uh, keep your questions as concise as possible, as usual. Thank you very much. This gentleman right here, and there's your mic. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Dr. Miraki, uh, and I have a question in regards to Afghanistan. Uh, there is this notion in some quarters that uh, the U.S. really didn't want stability, quote-unquote, in Afghanistan because of the following three, uh, three among the many factors. One is to give an entire monopoly, political monopoly, to the Northern Alliance, which have actually uh, held hostage in 30 million people with 500 people in various positions changing continuously. Number two, uh, political mo uh, economic monopoly of the same elements. And, and three, how they uh, take in targeted Taliban who have decided not to fight after the invasion because they forced them uh, to fall in Pakistan's lap, hence uh, an insurgency ensued thereafter. And lastly, why hasn't the U.S. mechanized the Afghan armed forces? In fact, the weapons or the uh, armored vehicles used in Afghanistan, they were given as gifts to Pakistan and Ukraine when in Afghanistan needed them uh, urgently. Your perspective on that. Thank you. Well, I, uh, some of the, what you said uh, I've heard before, uh, and uh, I used to hear it when I was ambassador also. I have to say that uh, 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 once we went into Afghanistan or Iraq, um, uh, I've had a hard time convincing many locals that the success of those countries is good for us then, because it, it, uh, uh, the success of those countries uh, enhances our prestige, it reduces the cost, uh, it uh, shows we are an effective power. Uh, uh, so the idea that some uh, people argue that we intentionally uh, want to look like we are failing uh, um, uh, I, is, is not persuasive to me because of, uh, uh, you know, our entire effort has been to, uh, to, to get these countries to succeed and to stand on their own feet and be a good partner for, for us and for the world. But uh, there are challenges and you've alluded to some that are important. First, the Northern Alliance issue with regard to Afghanistan, and uh, there may not be many Afghan experts in the audience, so you'll have to forgive me, uh, which is that the, uh, uh, we fought the war in Afghanistan against the Taliban, relying on local forces a lot. And it happened that the local forces were Northern Alliance forces, and, and uh, because we wanted to keep our footprint light because we didn't want to Tell, uh, signal to the Afghans we had come to occupy them because we thought that's a mistake that Soviets had made. But uh, 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 the reality was that after the war was over, those who were strong on the ground, which were the Northern Alliance, wanted uh, uh, that uh, preponderance to be reflected in the share of power. Now, we pushed back, the UN pushed back, uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, to get some Northern Alliance uh, people uh, into government, including the president, who was not a Northern Alliance figure, President Karzai. Uh, and uh, over time, uh, we tried to make the government as representative as possible through uh, various m things that happened. The transitional government uh, appointed by a, a Loe Jirga and then the elections. Uh, but uh, it took time. Uh, with regard to, uh, to uh, the uh, uh, Taliban reconciliation, it's possible, and I have to say that uh, uh, 
that we may have missed an opportunity, uh, uh, the details of which is still murky. Uh, uh, there is a, uh, uh, some evidence that perhaps soon after uh, the Bonn conference, not before Bonn, but after the Bonn conference, that uh, the Taliban may have uh, been willing to reconcile with the new government under some circumstances, but they chose uh, uh, the President Karzai as a mechanism to negotiate with, and that did not uh, uh, produce results. I have to say that I have discussed this issue recently with President Karzai when I saw him, uh, because of allegations in the media, and uh, that there was a piece of paper that was given to him by the Taliban saying, we accept you as legitimate, provided one, two, three, about their safety. I asked President Karzai, where is this piece of paper? I'd like to say then, why didn't you, if there is one, didn't you share it with me? Uh, he said, yes, there was such a piece of paper, but I gave it back to them, uh, to the Taliban who had come to see him. So, the, but, uh, so there, is, uh, the, there is a lot of analysis to be done, uh, but I, I, based on what I know now, I, it's possible that we may have, there may have been an opportunity, but I don't want to say it as, um, uh, stronger than that, than there may have been an opportunity. On Pakistan, uh, I think we'll get to that, I'm sure, again in another question. Yes. Another question over here. Um, I s oh, there's lots of hands. I see a hand at the very last row there. Thanks. So there's a fascinating book by William Dalrymple, The sure. Return of a King. Right. Do you see some similarity between <laughs> the U.S. invasion and the first Afghan war of 1839-42? Yeah, I've read that book, and I, I know that President Karzai has been impressed uh, with that book. I, I, I just believe that uh, the current circumstances are very different. Uh, the Afghan political process uh, uh, is, uh, is uh, progress with all its problem, there is a lot of participatory politics. Did you see t yesterday or today, hundreds of thousands of people asking, um, demonstrating, asking electricity should go, uh, transmission line should go through this area than that. Huge civil society uh, numbers, uh, huge press, uh, parliament that is, although there is corruption and all, but very uh, active, demanding uh, accountability from the executive. Uh, uh, politics has broken out, so to speak. You look at the unity government problems uh, that between the two leaders uh, working things out. Uh, uh, this is uh, this is quite different than selecting a king and uh, somewhere and uh, and sending him over and working behind the uh, the sort of uh, uh, scene, helping and manipulating uh, him. Anyone who believes that President Karzai was the king, like Shah Shuja, uh, was, was this king that who did what our bidding, uh, doesn't know President Karzai. Uh, uh, from Karzai one was a, a good partner, but Karzai two was a pain, uh, 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 and wherever it hurts the most. <laughs> so uh, it's, uh, I, I just think that uh, that it's a different world. Uh, you can't behave uh, based on the kind of 18th or 19th century uh, kind of uh, manipulative uh, systems that work there. I'm not saying there is no manipulation anymore, but it, uh, it's, a, it's, it's, it's different. It's a, it's a different world. So I, while I, I think the, uh, the book is a good one, uh, Afghan scholars should read it, but I think we, we overdraw lessons uh, uh, from it uh, for the current circumstances. Um, we have a lady here in the second row. <laughs> I'd like to go back to the swamp region. Yes. The current leaders today, right. from your perspective, their yeah. personalities, right. are they capable of coming together? Are there others coming along, secondary leaders, who would follow through or who have better ideas or are more capable? Yeah. Your perspective. Thank you. Well, that's an excellent question. Uh, I, I just don't know. Uh, I, I know that that's necessary uh, if we, uh, for progress of the kind that I ta I've talked about. But uh, what will it take to get to that? 
in terms of circumstances, does the, does the, the conflict or do the conflicts in the region have to become a lot worse before they do it? Uh, would there have to be some changes in some of the leaders for this to happen? I don't know that, and I, have, I would like, uh, in fact, uh, I was speaking at a very prominent think tank, and I was uh, urging them that they might take something like this on, so to speak, to, to game it. Uh, and uh, 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 it certainly is necessary if, uh, if we have to get rid of the swamp for that to happen. Now, uh, for all it's worth, the uh, Iranians at this point, based on uh, some discussions, say they are willing to enter into such a discussion. Uh, the Saudis and uh, the Turks are at the present time, uh, uh, the Saudis more reluctant uh, to enter into such a discussion because they think uh, Iran has to be put in its uh, right place first, that Iran has been too aggressive and effective in that aggressiveness, that it's sort of preeminent in Iraq as far as regional powers that has some considerable influence in Syria in playing in Yemen, playing in Bahrain, that uh, before the conversation gets started, they need to be pushed back, particularly a settlement of Syria, they think is very important. Uh, and maybe I, we have to see about the balance of, uh, the requirements of a balance of power, where uh, they, they feel assured enough that Iran will not be able to impose hegemony in the region may be necessary. But I, 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 I'm in part perhaps ducking your question frontally by saying whether the current leaders are capable of that. Uh, uh, um, I, I just don't know. I, I, would, I would surmise, uh, I may say yes, if the circumstances demands it. Uh, maybe, perhaps, if yes is too strong. Mm -hmm. Front row right here. You mentioned that uh, there was a pushback against the Northern Alliance, you know, in Afghanistan, so they don't want to take over the government there. And you use the lawyer Jurga and other kind of Afghani means, you know, to get to uh, General Assembly, Constitution, all of that. I couldn't help it but compare that with Iraq, where I feel that the United States institutionalized sectarianism there, you know. We decided so many Shiites, so many Turkmen, so many Sunnis, Kurds, and so on, which is something unconstitutional by our standard there. So your comment sure. on that, please. Well, uh, two things. One, I went to Iraq uh, two years after the invasion. I went there in 2005. So uh, my comments on the earlier period is not as well informed. Uh, so you have to take it into account. I already criticized that period uh, not all of it, but the initial part having to do with the dissolving of the army and uh, deep depatification and, uh, and small U.S. force all at the same time. But as far as sectarianism is concerned, uh, I uh, was involved in the, in the uh, negotiations uh, to agree on a constitution. I did the same thing in Afghanistan. And I know that some people believe that the U.S. went with the drafts of constitution for these countries in our back pocket and say, well, here is your uh, constitution. But in fact, that wasn't the case. I, I, I can say that in Afghanistan, uh, the constitution still has very, very broad support. I mean, one of the things they're proud of is the constitution. Uh, but they uh, agreed, despite the fact that some did not like it, on a unitary government, a unitary state with a very strong center running everything. And that was because they, they felt uh, that during the period uh, when they had a constitution like that under the, the king that I mentioned, things were working. It was, in retrospect, they looked at the period that was bothering me as Afghanistan being underdeveloped. And so backward and poor, they looked at it in retrospect with nostalgia. That was the golden era. There was stability. There was peace. And they initially essentially took that constitution and changed uh, all the powers of the king. They gave it to the president. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, the constitution is essentially that. In Iraq, uh, uh, something entirely different happened, and, uh, and which is 
uh, that uh, uh, the Kurds did not want a constitution without federalism. They didn't want a strong center. They wanted a, a, a weak center relatively because of their desire for autonomy. And the Shia, uh, I, I know that one would rather not speak in these terms, but the reality was that the parties that were organized uh, in the Shia communities of Iraq and the south and center were mostly Islamist uh, because they had been based in Iran and had come under the influence of the uh, Islamist ideas. And the uh, Ba'athists, who were the secular forces, uh, were under pressure because of the, what had happened in the debathification that I mentioned. Uh, and uh, the Sunnis were uh, uh, boycotting the political process. They opposed the invasion. And I tried to work hard to get the Sunnis into the political process and to help uh, trans uh, sectarian groups such as uh, Ayad Alawi's uh, uh, Iraqiya uh, party at that time to become more active. But uh, the reality was that the election produced uh, results that were very favorable to the Islamist Shia and the Kurds at their area. And it wasn't that the US would have preferred this sectarian uh, order in Iraq. I don't believe uh, that was our, our, our preference. But the reality uh, of uh, what had happened before and in Iraq and what happened as a result uh, that produced this, I regarded that to be a transitory phenomenon and that over time issue-oriented politics will replace uh, sectarian identity politics, that that was a phase that they were going through. And in fact, I was encouraged in the election of 2010 where uh, Ayad Alawi's party being cross-sectarian got the largest share Maliki had to adapt uh, from being a member of the Dawa party that's Islamist religious to state of law uh, party uh, which uh, to be able to appeal to broader uh, populations. But then our uh, uh, withdrawal, and I don't want to blame ourselves for everything when it doesn't go right, but I think our withdrawal and, and some of the decisions that the Iraqis made afterwards re-sectarianized, if, if there is such a word, and repolarized Iraq, and we are seeing the consequences of that. Another question. Yes, there's a young lady in the middle of the side. Um, my question pertains to the response of Afghanistan and Iraq with events like Abu Ghraib and the recent US drone attack that struck a Doctors Without Borders hospital in Afghanistan. Do events like these compromise the productivity of U.S. efforts in the region? And if so, what is that effect like? Well, I, I can't say that there is no effect, but there isn't, in those two places, not a huge effect. Uh, I think it more affects ourselves here, of uh, the image that we have of ourselves, and affects in, in Europe and the, the rest of the world. Uh, bec uh, I mean, the drone attacks uh, that's in the northwest frontier province of Pakistan, or now the, the, the name has changed to Pashtunkhwa province. Uh, the government of Pakistan, and the, which is a parliamentary government as the mandate of its people, support it. I mean, they, we, some of that attack is happening at their request. And in fact, there is some evidence that it has a lot of support in Pakistan not maybe in the areas where the attack occurs, but if you look at the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, Pakistan at large, because they feel threatened by those very forces that, uh, that, we, that, we, that the drones have, have targeted. Now, there are a lot of questions about the drones. I mean, we, the, we could spend a lot of time discussing, uh, discussing that, but at, at least in terms of, uh, of the reaction that you've asked, uh, 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 certainly in Afghanistan, I haven't heard a lot of negative reaction to drone attacks, especially in the, in the Pakhtunkhwa area. In Pakistani area, they want more of it and on different targets. They would like the US to attack uh, Taliban targets in Pakistan with drones. They would like to, uh, us to attack Akani network targets in Pakistan, and we have resisted going that route. So Abu Ghraib did have a, a, a a negative effect uh, in Iraq, but I think it uh, didn't change anything in a, in, a, in a fundamental or significant way. And a lot of people are talking about the Kunduz attack today because yes. of the very long article in the New York Times. Right. Um, 
what will be the effect of that attack in Afghanistan? Do you no, I don't think it will have a significant effect okay. uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, uh, it will, the effect will be on uh, and the Doctors Without Borders, what they think uh, uh, about that, on other NGOs, on the international uh, civil societies uh, writ large, mm -hmm. but not in Afghanistan, I don't believe. Thank you. Um, we'll take the person on the end. My name is Hussein Hitting. Thank you for your remarks. Uh, Iraq uh, and the Middle East, Sykes-Picot. Right. What do you see as the future of the Sykes-Picot borders? If they right. stay, how do you see it? If they would disappear, how do you see it? Yeah. Right. Well, I, uh, I think that uh, the borders um, are not as sacrosanct uh, to uh, some of the populations in the area. Although I would say they are also not without support, although their origins are questionable in terms of legitimacy in the eyes of the population. But they have acquired the degree of legitimacy because of time that has passed. But not to everyone. Uh, for example, you've been reading, I'm sure, recently President Barzani of Kurdistan, part of Iraq, arguing that we should put aside uh, Sykes Pico. In my judgment, uh, when you have uh, in the current period in that region, smaller identities politicized, sectarianism, uh, ethnic uh, uh, identity, uh, replacing bigger identities at one time, as I'm sure you know, the Arab nationalism uh, or uh, even Islam in its uh, more inclusive term. Uh, when you have these now, uh, smaller identities politicized, if you want to keep the states together, uh, the options, in my judgment, are power sharing at the center, like Lebanon, uh, or, or and, uh, a degree of decentralization, whatever you call it, whether you would call it federalism, confederalism, uh, may be necessary to keep these states from fragmenting. If effective decentralization and power sharing uh, do not become operational, uh, is not embraced by majority populations, uh, then I think there is a, a potential for uh, separation. And Iraq is going through this uh, crisis right now. Can they work something together to, uh, to uh, make a federal system or a, even a confederal system work? Or is it that the Kurds uh, who, have fail, who have felt that they were made part of Iraq uh, by colonial powers, they were promised independence, did not, was not given, uh, uh, they see no settlement that meets their needs and at the same time see an opportunity to separate, uh, they, they might, but in that case, if it does happen, uh, it would be good if it happens peacefully and as a result of an agreement rather than uh, through violence and, 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 and new, new source of, of conflict uh, uh, comes about. Let's see. There. Can you see someone? Oh, yeah, the one gentleman, young man. Okay, right. that's right. And Same then, row. Uh, and then we'll get somebody there. back yeah. here. Okay. Hi there. Thanks very much for uh, coming out tonight. Um, you mentioned that some of the, the wars, proxy wars in the region, have been you know funded by or benefit some of the major powers there. And I'm just curious, uh, the war going on now in Syria and on the border of Iraq, uh, if anyone's benefiting from that right now, and if so, who would it be? Well, I, I mean, certainly the local population uh, generally are suffering a lot, but the regionally, uh, I think, to put it uh, very um, uh, sharply, uh, the, any group that would stop, uh, from a Saudi perspective, the Iranians from having a land bridge crossing Iraqi territory, Syrian territory, Lebanon, and to Mediterranean is worthy of support. They, we, they think that's the most important issue. ISIS is uh, secondary to that, so to speak, and uh, Islamic uh, Brotherhood, uh, or Islamic Islamists, that some of whom we would worry about, is secondary to them. For us, ISIS is uh, first, 
some of these other issues are secondary. Uh, and, uh, you know, and that is why there is tension inside uh, the sort of the coalition and inside in terms of U.S. Gulf relations. We're trying to say we work on both, but the urgency of ISIS uh, is, is uh, palpable for, for us, so to speak. Uh, uh, and uh, the Turks have their own uh, issues and the Iranians have their own issues. So, uh, uh, to, but I, the example of Saudi Arabia clarifies this uh, point the most. I see. Um, I see a young lady in the back there. So with it being the last few months of the Obama presidency, what do you think that the president could have done in Syria, and what do you think he can possibly do in the last remaining months? Well, I, I think that what he should do, in my view, is to... Uh, build on what he has done with regard to Iran to uh, enhance engagement. Uh, I'm in favor of uh, uh, staffing the interest sections. If we can't establish full diplomatic relations, uh, I favor stab, uh, you know, staffing the interest section of our, uh, uh, in the Swiss embassy that represents us with Americans in Iran and put the, allowing Iranians to put uh, their diplomats in the Washington, Pakistan, which represents their interest. I favor a broader engagement, uh, and I f would like to see it more institutionalized uh, in terms of uh, travel. Uh, why not have flights between New York and, and Tehran? And uh, uh, I, 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 I believe that uh, too much uh, of the interaction with Iran is personalized between the Secretary of State and the Iranian Foreign Minister. We need to broaden it because one may not be there for after a few months for sure. Uh, it, that's uh, Secretary Kerry and uh, who knows about the, uh, the Iranian foreign minister. So we need to broaden uh, the engagement, uh, uh, not to keep it as limited as it is right now. Uh, that's one thing. Second, we need to embrace this strategic goal of getting a regional agreement uh, and start shaping things, gaming and shaping so uh, uh, the Iran thing that he will do would help the next administration, uh, but the shaping also could help. On Syria, I, uh, I do believe we, we could have done more, better. I, I, have been, was, I have been and I am in favor of uh, kind of uh, the safe zones. Uh, I understand some of the complexities, uh, but there are always uh, solutions to those complexities. Uh, we did a safe zone in Iraq after the Gulf War. It, uh, otherwise, a lot of Kurds would have left uh, Kurdistan and gone to uh, there. I'm not saying it's identical to that. There was at least Kurdish forces that could maintain security in that zone with a few Americans. But I think we could come up, could have come up. Uh, uh, I also believe in that we could have done no-fly zones. Uh, um, uh, I think we will pay for a very long time. Uh, uh, for Syria. Uh, I think what has happened there w will shape several generations of Syrians. And the people have seen their lives that turn upside down uh, in, a, in a very short time. They've seen terrible things happen to, to them. Uh, and I, I think the recovery and normalization will take a long time and the world will pay a high price uh, before this is all done. Uh, if Syria is to me like Afghanistan of the 1990s, where after a traumatic war f by the uh, fight, fought against the Soviets and get abandoned and they go uh, this horrible internal war, uh, extreme circumstances come about in which only extremists can survive. You can't be a moderate and live uh, under barrel bombs uh, or potential chemical weapons. Uh, how, uh, you know, you have to believe this is the will of God and God, you know, there is all kinds of extremist uh, interpretations to survive in that environment. And, and, and I think uh, 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 this will play itself out in a very bad way for some time to come. Yes, we have, uh, we did uh, reduce risks to ourselves in the short term in terms of costs because the, uh, if we did the no-fly zone, did the uh, safe zones, there were risks with that, uh, 
but we have traded that risk with future risks that we will face uh, and the world will face uh, and uh, Europe is already facing uh, uh, for, for some time to come. So in the trade-off between near and long, we have, uh, we have uh, erred on the, uh, on the side of doing the, the right thing for ourselves in the near. But now we have to think about how to mitigate the longer term risk from this crisis. Well, I hate to end on that kind of message. So do you want to give us 30 seconds of hope on Syria? Is there something that we can do to, um, to, to, help, to help? Well, a settlement. This, a, 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 settlement a regional settlement that includes West Syria, settlement. Westphalia, is yeah. what uh, okay. uh, puts the region on the right footing. And I'm not pessimistic. Uh, that that is achievable, although maybe not immediately, because we have seen dysfunctional regions. Uh, we see Europe's own history. We see Southeast Asia after Vietnam, where people were pessimistic. The domino is falling, and uh, they managed to come through. Even recently in the Balkans, uh, we see positive signs. So uh, it's, uh, 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 one can't be uh, altogether negative, otherwise one has to uh, 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 not leave <laughs> one's house, uh, but uh, no, I think that uh, the, uh, the one has to take a longer term strategic view of what is needed to normalize this region and what role the world and ourselves can play and, uh, uh, while we avoid uh, uh, mistakes that could entangle us, uh, I understand that, in a protracted war uh, of, 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 of religious nature uh, that could zap our energies and be expensive and have a huge negative consequence. So uh, I hope my comments about the no-fly zone and uh, the security zone or safe zones is not that I'm in favor of us uh, getting involved uh, in, the, in the war going, sending thousands of Americans to go to war in this region. No, we must avoid that. Um, but there are things we could do uh, both on the security front, on the humanitarian front, and on the longer term political front uh, to help uh, uh, move uh, uh, this region, help move this region toward normalcy. Well, among your many successes in a lifetime of service to our government was encouraging the establishment of American universities in Iraq and Afghanistan. Sure. And Ambassador Khalilzad is leaving well, he's leaving Chicago in about an hour and a half, but he's leaving Washington, D.C. tomorrow morning to go back to Afghanistan to be the commencement speaker at the American University of, Af of Afghanistan, yeah. which kind of takes us back to the beginning of your life when right. you were at uh, the American University of Beirut. So we thank you very much for, you. for your lifetime of service and thank for being you. here today. Thank you. Thank you very much.